thank you all for coming today. This is a grand audience, given that the Secretary of the Navy is a competition. And so we're very pleased that all of you decided to come. Um, this is our annual Constitution Day talk, this year not on Constitution Day. Uh, and um, Vlad Perju and I, for the last couple years, have collaborated on coming up with a speaker who we think would be interesting and fulfill the federal mandate that we do something for Constitution Day from a perspective that might not be what everybody would think you should do on Constitutional Day. So once again, from that perspective, um, today we are delighted to have um, a very good friend of mine, Professor Michael Vornberg, uh, up from Brown. When Mike and I were talking about him coming up, I said, well, I really want someone who can talk about the fact that it's also the 150th anniversary of the 1866 Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment. And so um, we ended up with this exceptionally long title in advance um, in order to basically commemorate all of these very important uh, events. Um, Michael and I have known each other a very, very long time now. And I'm still looking forward to a book that he promised me he would eventually write on um, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Um, this was out of a discussion we had about how the only books that sell are people who are on American money. And so I thought if you did one of two important people on American money, you could actually make a lot of money. And so um, both Michael and I are constantly trying to sell out and neither of us, the fact that we still have day jobs tells you we haven't been very successful at that. Um, Michael got his undergraduate and graduate degree uh, in history from Harvard, that's where I met him, and he won the best dissertation prize in history that year and has continued to write extraordinary work in the two decades um, since then. He is most famous currently for uh, his 2001 book, Final Freedom, the Civil War, the Abolition of Slavery, and the 13th Amendment. When that came out, it was an extraordinary book, the first book to really chart the history uh, of the 13th Amendment uh, and of Abraham Lincoln's involvement uh, in the abolition of slavery. It was a finalist for the Lincoln Prize that year. It has become more famous because he is the most important uncredited historian ever with respect to a major motion picture. Um, the book basically was used by the Steven Spielberg people for what became Lincoln, although Dor Doris Kearns Goodwin was given, I think, technical credit. Such is life, and, and Mike is a lovely person and doesn't complain. I personally would complain vociferously if that had happened to me, but Mike is much more generous. He's also been a member of um, Brown University's uh, steering Committee on Slavery and Justice, and I think one of the things that I've loved about Mike's work over the years has been he is an exceptionally well-grounded historian uh, who cares a lot about the history, but who's also been very interested in its relevance um, to the present and, um, and been very much part, very much involved in uh, Brown University's efforts. So with no further ado, my good friend Mike. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, and thank you all for coming on kind of a <laughs> just warm and somewhat subdued place. I'll start yelling as I see the heads start nodding off. Uh, I forgot about the whole idea of pres that this was a money issue, the presidents and money. We, Hamilton might have been good. Yeah, we, we, didn't, we didn't get ahead of the curve on that. Um, so I am here because it's Constitution Day, and As Mary mentioned, it was an opportunity not only to talk about the Constitution, but more specifically the 14th Amendment and the measure that led to the 14th Amendment, which was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The 14th Amendment, um, I guess there probably are some lawyers in the room, so they can comment on this, but it's arguably the most important uh, amendment of the US Constitution. I suppose some people say, what about the first? But when it comes to simply how uh, judicial opinions are given at the federal level, the 14th is always, almost always there. And uh, it's the central thing that one has to engage with in courses on constitutional law. So it's a big deal. 
Uh, and it's a big deal for other reasons, too, that I'll be talking about that are probably familiar to some of you. The 14th Amendment was passed by Congress in 1866. And it was passed just a couple months after the Civil Rights Act of 1806 was passed. That means that we are now at the beginning of the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. Uh, I say the beginning because it wasn't ratified till 1868. So we've now got two years of uh, anniversarizing to do uh, for the 14th Amendment. Uh, and I suspect you'll be hearing more than you want to hear about the 14th Amendment, as, you, as if you haven't heard enough, especially if you're in a law school. Um, so, when we talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1866, it's an act that um, I'm going to give you quite a bit of detail about momentarily, but it's the act that is sets up the 14th Amendment because it passes Congress. The President, Andrew Johnson, vetoes it. Congress passes it over his veto. And then, as the standard narrative goes, in order to shield it even more from a presidential veto or unenforcement or from the possibility of the Supreme Court someday ruling it unconstitutional, uh, they frame very similar language in a constitutional amendment. That becomes the 14th Amendment. So the sequence here is very important in how we tell the story of how we get to the 14th Amendment. And the sequence is uh, fundamentally a post-war sequence. It is a sequence that <clears throat> begins after we assume the American Civil War is over. And that's what I want to engage with today, and that's the reason for this talk, that is the 14th Amendment as an act of war. Because in fact, um, it was not passed during uh, peacetime, it was passed during wartime. And that's a very hard thing to get one's mind around, but it's legally true, it's existentially true, and uh, therefore, I need to spend some time explaining why that is. So uh, let me back up uh, just a little bit. The book I'm working on now is sort of a side project. I've been working on a book about citizenship and the Civil War for a long time, and that necessarily involves the 14th Amendment, because the 14th Amendment has, in its first sentence, this clause about citizenship and birth which we're hearing a lot about uh, these days around immigration and so forth. But I decided to do a side project for reasons I won't get into now about when is it that we can say that the Civil War ended? And this isn't a cultural product on people today who still say the South will rise again or that the Civil War is continuing, but it, although that's part of the end. But it really is a book about the Civil War itself uh, and, and how we can say it's over. The war we imagine to be over, generally if, if you take uh, history as a grade school student, we have a magical moment at Appomattox uh, Courthouse in Virginia on April 9th, 1865, where Lee surrenders to Grant and the war is over. So in no possible way is that war over on that day. It's not over because Grant and Lee meet the next day and they agree that the war is not over. Grant asks Lee to ask Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, uh, to surrender all forces. And Lee says, I won't, I can't. And Davis isn't going to surrender anyway. So there are two armies that are larger than Lee's that are still in the field uh, for years. The legal end of the Civil War, the day that the Civil War is over for purposes of law when figuring things like pensions and so forth, is August 20, 1866, 16 months after Appomattox. Why that date, I can explain, but the darkness in this heat will put you to sleep for sure. I will, I, will get, I will get there eventually. But what that means is that legally, the Civil Rights Act and the measure for the 14th Amendment when it passes Congress are accomplished at a time of war. That's not just a sort of legal nicety or interesting bit. It's not only a time of war, it's a time when there were tens of thousands of United States troops, army men, uh, in the American South and West as occupiers 
there under the auspices that this was still a time of war. So I'm going to lay out for you a little bit um, how you can see that, that is the, the war quality of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Then I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the implications for that for its time, uh, how that war quality of the Civil Rights Act affected the time uh, of Reconstruction, 1866-67. And then say just a little bit at the end about what this all means for today as we think about the Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment. Uh, the 14th Amendment, of course, is still with us, but so is most of the Civil Rights Act. Although the uh, post-Civil War Supreme Court uh, ruled unconstitutional some of the crucial Civil Rights Acts, especially the one in 1875, uh, the crucial pieces of the 1866 Act slipped through, and I'll say more about what these are. And they are still on the books today. Um, and they are the residue, uh, among other things, of the American Civil War, not only peacetime reconstruction. So I'll speak for about another um, 30 minutes or 35 minutes, and then I'll happily uh, take questions uh, to try to clarify uh, what I've been saying. I'm on the fence about whether to give the handout. I am going to do it. Uh, the reason I'm on the fence is because it's like a book, uh, and I'm worried that you'll read the whole thing, and then I'm sure you'll fall asleep. Uh, because this is the text uh, of most, but not all, of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It is the text of all of the 14th Amendment. And, on, and then on the flip side is a chronology and if you see that I start to go quickly through chronology, you can sort of follow along uh, with this chronology to see what I'm saying. So the 14th Amendment um, has crucial language in its first clause. It has five clauses, but the first one is the one that's most often used. That isn't to do any disservice to the other ones. First sentence has to do with uh, birthright citizenship. This was making sure that the former slaves would now be citizens. Um, and then, of course, it has famous issue, famous phrases around equal protection of the laws, due process, privileges, and immunities, famously for uh, the constitutional theorists in the room. So that comes after the 13th Amendment. As uh, Mary mentioned, I wrote a book about the 13th Amendment. And when the 13th Amendment is ratified in 1865, uh, they don't know that there's a 14th Amendment coming. That is, they assume that this is the amendment and all the amendment that's needed to deal with the problems of, uh, that may ensue from the American Civil War. And that's important for all sorts of reasons. Uh, because one thing is, when you look at Clause 2, where it says Congress shall have power to enforce, this, is, this amendment is ratified in December of 1865. Congress comes into session in that month, December of 1865. And they say, now is the time to enforce that 13th Amendment. Again, they're not thinking about the 14th Amendment. And so they begin to draft what will become the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is there to enforce abolition, which is there to enforce emancipation. That is the primary purpose of the act. The act had special purpose as well, because during the summer of 1865, between the passage of the 13th Amendment through Congress and its ratification, all of the southern states uh, are passing so-called black codes. And I show you just a few from Louisiana, from one Louisiana parish in the summer of 65, so you can well, you can't see. But these are uh, clearly codes that are meant to preserve a labor system akin to slavery. Um, and they include uh, everything from um, no Negro shall be permitted to rent or keep a house within said parish, so they have to do with home ownership, 
Section 4, every Negro is required to be in the regular service of some white person. So you have to be able to prove that you have a job, and not just any job, but a job being paid by a white person. Um, Negroes are not allowed to carry firearms. That's in there, too. Um, so these black codes are passing, and they show that the 13th Amendment needs enforcement, and the enforcement that comes that's meant to override these black codes is the Civil Rights Act. And this is the first clause. <clears throat> the full text is um, the handout, and it's very long. <laughs> um, but it's crucial because it has, it's the first time we then, it's before the 14th Amendment, it's the first time we see birthright citizenship where it says if you're born in this country, you are a citizen or naturalized, of course. And then it lists what rights attach to freedom. So this is the enforcement, and they includes all the things that those black codes are trying to deny. Living where you want to live, working where you want to work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot more I could say about the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and maybe if you have questions about it, I'll, I'm happy to talk about it. I'll say two things just to maybe tickle the interest of lawyers in the room or, or people who are really serious constitutionalists and want to know more about language. First, um, if you look at the Civil Rights Act, uh, you'll see that it's enforcing the 13th Amendment and that what it says is that all persons, and then it goes on to say all these things, and that they will have full and equal benefit of all laws. Full and equal benefit. That's language that's not in the 14th Amendment. Uh, what does it mean to have full benefit? Not just equal, like equal protection, but full benefit. That's a really interesting phrase. Um, furthermore, there's no what we call state action clause. So the 14th Amendment says no state shall, and then it says all the things that can't happen. But this is much more a positive statement of what will come to all persons. So in this way, it's much more opening and much more broad uh, in terms of giving rights. But even so, it could have been even broader because it focuses on this word citizens, which has become uh, an obsession of recent, uh, in recent history, of course. Are you a citizen? Are you not? And so forth. And an earlier draft of that, um, <clears throat> of that measure, when it passes, there's great excitement. This is the scene in the galleries. But an earlier draft, the Senate version, says that there should be no discrimination in civil rights means among the inhabitants. It doesn't say citizens. It says inhabitants. The language is changed as a crucial moment. The word citizen is inserted. Now, it's true that that category of citizen is broadened, and that's a good thing, absolutely. But by changing that word, you're still using a term that is exclusive in citizen. And it was done quite purposely, really to keep out of the category of citizenship the Chinese. So the Western lawmakers in particular were very worried that if language like the first type got in, that then uh, the many residents of California and the Southwest and some in the East uh, who were Chinese, not born in the US, but actually uh, born in China, could make a claim to citizenship. And this was in large part to keep that from, from happening. And so all of this um, is happening <clears throat> in the spring of 1866, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act of 1866 in, um, in the spring. It's paired with another piece of legislation which renews the Freedmen's Bureau Act, Freedmen's Bureau Act, uh, and that means that the Freedmen's Bureau will still be active in the South. That is a bureau under the War Department. And so the War Department will oversee relations between freed people and white people in the South which right away tells you that it's a time of war because Congress is taking something that was set up during the war, the Freedmen's Bureau, and saying it shall continue. And it shall continue as a War Department agency. It will be staffed by Army people. It will be staffed by lawyers who are technically have positions in the Army. Um, and the 
venues in which these will be held will be official legal venues. That is, they will be military commissions or courts in areas uh, where there are civilian courts operational. So that Freedmen's Bureau Act is pretty clearly a wartime act as well. It will, um, it has a terminus, that is, uh, it has an end date, and when the Freedmen's Bureau ends, that's it. Not so with the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act is forever uh, when it's passed. And therefore, historians tend to say, well, the Civil Rights Act is kind of the peacetime act, and the Freedmen's Bureau is the wartime act, but that's just not true. First of all, as I said, the war is not over. Um, we think of the war as being over because of the great surrender uh, which is now mythologized in American history, uh, at the surrender at Appomattox. Um, and I'm so glad that the student who I stole this picture from is here. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Sam. That, uh, so it's still Appomattox has the word, if you haven't heard before, that's surprising me, but it has this notion of an ending, a clean ending. But it wasn't, uh, as I said before. And if you then go into the Civil Rights Act knowing that the war is still going on, then things begin to make a certain degree of sense. To return to the Civil Rights Act now, this is the famous first clause. And then it has all these other clauses. Now, I'm not going to walk you through all this language, but I'll say um, whoops, instead that um, one of the things about the Civil Rights Act that a lot of people know is kind of an interesting bit, and it's a, it's a wonderful uh, thing that the Republican congressman who passed it did, is they created most of the language by turning the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 on its head. So the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was a national act, a federal act, that mandated um, the processing of people who were accused of being fugitive slaves and set up the legal systems by which these people would be deemed to be slaves or not. The act federalized local legal officials, police and judges. They federalized them for the purpose of making them uh, commissioners and they stacked the deck uh, in favor of the slave owner to make sure that the slaves were returned. Uh, and they did this uh, to their masters and not declared free. And they did this in all sorts of ways, most infamously by giving the commissioner who ruled in the case $10 if this slave was remanded and, and back into slavery and five if um, they were set free. So they take the Civil Rights Act and they, f and they, take, they go back to the Fugitive Slave Act and they do the exact same thing. And they say, we are going to federalize all local officials for the purpose of enforcing freedom. And that you must enforce freedom. And so the language for most of this uh, is taken from the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Most, but not all. There are a couple clauses where, and it happens uh, here, Towards the end in Clause 4, there's some talk about um, where armed forces will be used to enforce civil rights. But the really important ones are here in Section 8 and 9. These clauses get not studied at all. So uh, everything I've read about the Civil Rights Act uh, just sort of dismisses 8 and 9, Sections 8 and 9, sort of immediately, as they don't know what to do with them. And that strikes me as interesting, because there they are. What they do, um, without trying to get into each word, you can look at them if you want, but what they effectively do is this. If the president or the president's delegate, which would include the secretary of war, the general in chief, or other general, if such an officer of the army, because the president's commander in chief, suspects, either knows or suspects, that this act is being violated, that is, that there are freed people whose rights are being violated or who violence is going to be done to them, uh, that the military can act and they can send in the troops. But it goes even further because in section nine it says that it'll be lawful 
Uh, for the president or such person as he may empower for them to employ such part of land or nail force as shall be necessary to prevent the violation and enforce the due execution of this act. To prevent the violation. So it's not just about waiting until, for example, there's been a massacre of African Americans in a place like New Orleans or Memphis, which happens in 1866 in both cities. But you can act, you could argue, you must act proactively that if your officers, if your soldiers on the ground know or even suspect that there is a conspiracy that could lead to a violation of civil rights and to violence, that they are empowered to act against that conspiracy. There it is in the 1866 Civil Rights Act. That uh, principle would come into full bloom five years later with enforcement acts that no longer exist. But even those enforcement acts didn't go as far. They didn't say that the army could act proactively, or to use the better word, preemptively. Preemptively. And that word is really crucial. Because I began to ask myself, where did this phrase come from, this wording? Because that's what lawmakers do. They kind of pick and choose. They took a lot of it from the Fugitive Slave Act. Where did they get this stuff? Where they got it is kind of interesting. Uh, they got it not from anything having to do with slavery, but they got it from the language of international law. And specifically, they got it from an incident which is very well known to international lawyers, but not necessarily to others, and especially those who work on the law of war. Because where they got it is from the uh, language that gives us today the doctrine of preemptive war the very doctrine that was used in 2001 uh, to effectively, uh, and, and in the years that later, that President Bush used to sign the army to act preemptively, right? By the way, this is also an anniversary. It's the 15th anniversary, not quite to the day, but to the month, of George Bush signing uh, the authorization for the use of force. That's something that was renewed, has been renewed every single year in September including by President Obama. He's yet to do it this month, which is intriguing, and there's some question of whether he will. Although he did sign the act earlier this month, uh, as Bush did, declaring a state of emergency. Um, so we're still in a state of emergency. I mention this not just because it's interesting, but it, because it's the same kind of environment that you have to imagine there being in in 1866, a state of war, a state of emergency, where a conspiracy can erupt that will commit violence against um, freed people, but worse, will re-enslave them and will set slavery back on course to where it was, which means will bring the Civil War back. And so you have to cut this at the stem, and that's what this is to do. And so you reach back into international law. The specific incident in question, um, Black and Trumbull is uh, the major author, and he's the one responsible for this clause. He's a very clever lawmaker and writer. He's also the author, the major author, one of the major ones of uh, 13th Amendment to the 14th. All of this goes back to an incident uh, from 1837 that we call the Caroline Incident. So now I take us away from the Civil War, away from slavery, into Niagara Falls. A small group of uh, British citizens living in Canada have plotted a rebellion against the Crown. And they're working on the, uh, on the Canadian side of the Niagara River. They have help from the American side. So there are Americans that are running guns and supplies across the Niagara to the, the British uh, people who are in rebellion. The British authorities catch wind of this. And the Caroline, which is an American ship on the and it's anchored on the American side. The Brits go into, cross the river, unmoor the ship, set it on fire on the river, and let it go, and it flows over the falls as people watch. Now, this of course could have been considered an invasion of the United States by the United Kingdom, but it wasn't, um, because the British minister, and it's then agreed to by others, including Daniel Webster, 
uh, who's the key American figure in this, the Brits make an argument that uh, when a country knows that an act of war is about to be committed to them, they shouldn't have to wait until that act is done. They can act preemptively, and that's what they were doing when they burned the Caroline. So there's this back and forth dispute for years that finally it's resolved in a treaty of 1842, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. Um, but even before that, uh, Congress acknowledges this, because Webster makes Congress acknowledge that the Brits did something that was legal, because Webster's trying to avoid a war with Britain. And so Congress actually even passes an act, and this is what it looks like in 1838. And I, I won't get into it, but the language, if I read it, is word for word the language of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It says if the president or his delegates knows um, that uh, for the security of its territory or country, uh, they can send in troops and act preemptively. And so Trumbull takes this language from 38, puts it in the Civil Rights Act. And this goes along with, like I said, the environment of a military uh, act for the Freedmen's Bureau. It goes along with um, Richard Henry Dana, Jr., and his very famous speech at the time that he gives in Boston in June of 1865. Dana um, was really famous. He was a dashing young man in, on the left who, uh, who wrote uh, this incredible travelogue uh, two years before the mass that many of you probably have read. And that's how he made a name for himself. But then he went to finally study law. He became arguably the best or one of the best known international lawyers by the time of the Civil War. And June of 1865, that is months after Appomattox, he gives an address at Faneuil Hall and he says, you say that the war is over. Some, he says, Some say that the war is over. The war is not over. A war is over when its purpose is secured. It is a fatal mistake to hold that this war is over because the fighting has ceased. This war is not over. We, in the, we are in the attitude and in the status of war today. One nation, when it has conquered another, does not give up or retreat. Rather, here comes the phrase, it holds the enemy in a grasp of war. So this is often called the grasp of war speech. This was Dana's approach. It's the approach of the Republicans. Much of the fighting is over in terms of formalized armies, but there's still fighting going on. There's guerrilla warfare. Uh, there's fighting in Texas. There's I could go on about the actual fighting. There's people at sea who are fighting. Um, but we're also in a state of war, and if you hold the enemy in the grasp of war, then you can pass legislation uh, against it to make sure that that enemy is crushed for good uh, and that it's done until the victor has secured whatever it has a right to require. Dana thought it had a right to require not only civil rights for African Americans, which he talks about, but voting rights uh, for black men. So all of this is happening during this period. And like I said, in terms of um, what this means, the Civil Rights Act passes um, in March. It's vetoed by Andrew Johnson. Uh, Congress in April overrides uh, the veto. And then over the summer of 1866, so that is just months after this is passed, so you have a law, and now you have all these, well, there's all sorts of violence against African Americans at the local level on a day-to-day -day basis. But the things that really catch the nation's attention uh, are the so-called riots, but today we tend to call them more aptly massacres. Uh, first in Memphis, May 1st through the 3rd, and each of these has a long story behind it, which I won't get into now. Uh, Memphis is interesting because uncoincidentally, it happens the day after the one black regiment in Memphis musters out. So the black regiment that's occupying Memphis musters out, they're ordered to take off their uniforms, and the next day, uh, the white 
paramilitary groups attack. Um, it begins at a courthouse and then spreads. Uh, and they focus especially on um, the black veterans and their families. New Orleans is a somewhat different story. Um, it happens, uh, it's a one day event in, in July. Uh, here, what you see is, uh, this is this is all Memphis. New Orleans happens July 30th, um, where, again, we still don't even know the numbers of people who are killed, but it could be as many as 100, but the more likely estimates are more like 60. That's happening in July. So clearly now we say, the people in government say, look, this is exactly what something like the Civil Rights Act is for. Obviously, it's for things like enforcing contracts, making sure contracts are fair, making sure housing arrangements are fair. But it is also about um, preventing these kinds of things. And so the Republicans in Congress, with their greatest aid, uh, in the executive branch, and that would be uh, Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War. They are dead set on um, using the army to react to, but also to keep from happening uh, things like I just showed you. Now, they have many tools at their disposal to do this. The army is still in the South, and there are general orders uh, that the War Department has given that allow the Army to be in the South. There are military courts and commissions in the South that are being used to try whites and uh, white people who are accused of violence and other uh, civil rights violations. So the instruments are there. Even without the Civil Rights Act, you have all these things that are holdovers from the Civil War that are still in place and that Stanton and the Army can use. But then here comes Andrew Johnson. Now Johnson's the commander in chief. And step by step, Johnson begins to undercut what the army can do. Uh, and he does this in a number of ways. First, in April of 1866, he proclaims that the war is over in all places except for Texas. Why Texas? Um, it's Texas. Uh, I don't know. I, know. I do know. But I, it's because there, no one could possibly say that the war is over in Texas because uh, the depredations there are happening every day and it's a complete mess. But in April, he says, the insurrection is over. And in this way, he is signaling that it's time to muster out the wartime troops and to move the nation to peacetime and that the enforcement that Stanton and the Republicans want to do is not going to be being done anymore. We're, we're slowly going to turn it over uh, to the southern states. Then, at the end of the summer, in August of 1866, August 20th, in fact, he goes one step further and says, it's over even in Texas. It's over everywhere. So that's why August 20th, 1866, is used by the War Department, for example, as the, today, as the formal end date of the Civil War, because the president proclaimed it. Now, this in itself is interesting. Uh, for some years now, I've been saying that of all the war powers that the American president has, you could argue that the most important war power of all is the power to declare when a war is over. That power is not granted in the Constitution. Wars are supposed to end by treaties. It's very clearly set up in the Constitution. But in fact, in practice, uh, in the 20th century and certainly in the 21st, it is the president to whom we look to declare when a war is over. And what we've seen over the last 15 years is this kind of bumbling move after bumbling move of a president trying to declare the war over. Not just Bush's infamous you know, mission accomplished speech, which was such an example, uh, but <laughs> But Obama's been guilty of this too. And it just, of course, doesn't quite work. But that's what Andrew Johnson was trying to do. But he has help. He has help from the United, Supreme, United States Supreme Court. Because the court for some time has been wrestling with the issue of, is it constitutional for military courts to exist in places where there are civil courts, namely the South? 
as the southern states are reconstructing and reestablishing their civil law and their courts, why should military law still exist here? That's the argument made, of course, by uh, prior Confederates, states' rightists, and by Andrew Johnson. This case will be resolved in the Milligan decision of 1866, kind of. This is a terribly misunderstood decision. The Milligan decision is announced in April of 1866 by the court. What the court announces is that the people who are, who've been accused and convicted by military tribunals, commissions, excuse me, um, are now going to be set free. That's all that the April decision does. And then it says an actual opinion will be coming later. That's April 66. The actual published opinion doesn't come till January 1, 1867. Now, if there are constitutional lawyers in the room, I would like to know the answer to this because I've not gotten, I've never gotten an answer to this. Is there ever another moment where a decision is announced but the opinion takes more than six months to follow? This was deliberately done because, the, I believe, because the Chief Justice, Sam and Chase, understood the implications that if the decision held weight, that is, if it had the weight of an, of an official opinion, which it didn't in April 66, it was not a written opinion, that it would undercut Reconstruction. So he waits to give the Congressional Republicans, Stanton, time to figure some other way out of how to use the army to get Reconstruction done. But he can only wait so long. And on January 1st, actually, the, the decision is issued from the bench in December, and then it's published in the newspapers January 1st, 1867. At which point, Stanton knows he's in trouble. Because these general orders that he has given and that Johnson has allowed that are effectively the same thing as what we have today when we have a status of forces agreement with another country that allow, for example, American troops to be in Afghanistan or Iraq, where there's a civil government, but they're American. That's a, it's exactly the same. Um, that was the status. And what the Milligan decision says is that is to be no more. If there's a civil government, there is to be no military commissions. And so what happens is that Stanton's got to figure a way out. What can he do to keep his army there to enforce civil rights? And then he goes and he reads the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And he sees this clause in it that no one has really talked about. But it's the one I mentioned. And he says, wait a second, there's a clause there that says the president or his delegates can use the army proactively. And he writes a memo. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't known this already, you probably figured Stanton and Johnson hate each other. But they're stuck with each other. Uh, in uh, Johnson, the president, Stanton, the, the, the um, uh, war secretary, and eventually Johnson will fire him, and Johnson will be impeached for firing. It's a complicated story. Uh, but before all that, Stanton's still there. Stanton writes a memo. He cuts out the clause, Clause 9, which I showed you before. And he writes a memo uh, to himself that he's going to share with the cabinet. Uh, and it's this, what it is, it's a resolution that he's going to have the president try to sign off on that says, because of this clause, um, it is ordered that the commanders of the several military governments are hereby empowered to employ the forces of the U.S. to prevent the violation of force insurance. Basically, let the army stay and do what it's been doing. So it's the way around Milligan. In the end, Johnson rejects this. Johnson rejects everything else. But it doesn't matter. Because a more temporary solution that solves everything comes out. First. Congress passes Military Reconstruction. The Military Reconstruction Act does all of this that I've just mentioned. And they override Johnson's veto. Then they're worried about, well, is Johnson going to use the army? They don't have to worry about that anymore because they impeach him. They don't quite convict him. But he's off the table at that point. So events take care of themselves. But everything I've just mentioned is short term. The Military Reconstruction Act has an end date. But for this moment, this brief moment of a few months, we can see how this act, it's not a peacetime act. It's envisioned now by the Secretary of War as a potential wartime act to be used to um, occupy the South, to make sure that emancipation is done right, which is to say that civil rights are guaranteed 
that the freed people are protected, and that this is done not only in a reactive, but a proactive way. All of this flowing from what is the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which then, of course, becomes the 14th Amendment, although these enforcement issues um, are not in the 14th Amendment. But what if one wanted to be a clever constitutional theorist, you could use some like a QLMR-like interlanguage stuff to put these two together and say that the 14th Amendment has this kind of enforcement to it because they were, after all, passed by exactly the same people having exactly the same intent. It's not such a stretch. And uh, I've never spoken to Amar about this, so I don't mean to say maybe, maybe he's already suggested such a thing. I don't think so, though. Um, so that's uh, what the act does. Now, those who are really interested in original intent may ask me, well, the congressmen who created that clause, uh, the clause that Stanton uses that I showed you, was that their intent? Did they really envision the war going on indefinitely and that the army would be used indefinitely? Um, and with any such question, original intent is always elusive. I could certainly speak to the fact um, that there were congressmen at this time, and Lyman Trumbull being the most uh, obvious, who said exactly this, um, that basically that this act was to make sure that the tendrils of slavery never reappear to destroy the country again. And if that means using the army, so be it. And he's also a very clever politician because he says, because the Democrats are saying that this clause uh, is too overreaching. It might create a military dictatorship. And Trumbull has a wonderful answer. He says, well, obviously, when they passed it in 1838, they weren't worried about it. They passed it then, and that was a Democratic president, Martin Van Buren. And the country seemed to live through it. So what's your problem? And so he's a very clever politician. So I can speak more to the original intent, if you wish. Um, but the more important thing is then, what does this all mean uh, for today? And I can't give you um, the definitive answer on what it necessarily means, but I can make some excuse me, suggestions. It seems to me that if we now begin to understand the Civil Rights Act uh, and potentially the 14th Amendment on its own terms, um, what we then begin to see is a couple things. First of all, that the doctrine of preemptive war like it, hate it, whatever. What you should not do is think that it's somehow the product of a recent vintage war against terror. It is not. It is the product of a war against terror from 1865 to 1867, where the terror was against black people. And I use that word quite deliberately because it is exactly the word terror that was used during the Ku Klux Klan hearings and even before to describe what white paramilitary groups were doing against African Americans. And I say paramilitary, sometimes they're not paramilitary, they're the police. Uh, in the case of the New Orleans riot, the first killing is done by a New Orleans cop. So um, to think about that is kind of important that preemptive war might have some legitimacy, but if you're gonna give it legitimacy, give it the correct legitimacy. That is not just to use against these kind of remote terrorists who get to be constructed as the government chooses to construct them. It was also to make sure that the rights of American citizens who were the least protected were protected and to use preemptive war to make sure that is done. So that's a, a way to think about international law and preemptive war in a new way. And the other implication is sort of more obvious, which is to think of the civil rights, uh, to civil rights generally today, as something where the use of federal force isn't just necessarily a one-off. It is absolutely allowable, reactively and proactively, in places where 
you know that there is or could be discrimination against African Americans, badges of servitude, which might include racial profiling or disproportionate sentencing, et cetera, et cetera. That these are exactly what the civil rights folks had in mind and that they had in mind this as a military measure. In 1957, when the National Guard is sent to Arkansas, it's done so, the authority that Eisenhower uses is a piece of the National Guard Act. What piece? The piece that had come from the Civil Rights Act that was taken out of the Civil Code and put into the National Guard Act. If you're wondering what happened to that clause, that's where it ended up. So in a sense, when he sent the troops to Arkansas, he was doing exactly uh, what Stanton and other Republicans would have expected him to do. The question is, why aren't we doing it today? Thank you. I'll take questions.